I think Endgame is a good movie with a lot of good moments and I think if it was literally any other Marvel movie it would have been one of the best and yet when I came out of movie theaters it felt quite lackluster to me like the moments in it were good but I felt like not a lot of it relies on previous stuff I was invested in and I don't mean like in a nostalgia bait way I mean uh, this is your last movie in a whole saga most of your stuff should be concluding and working with what's been set up like it felt like a good movie but not a good sequel a lot of these issues centered for me around Thanos and how he was handled, but there were a lot of issues that lined up with this core problem. So without further ado, hello and welcome to another rewrite video. God, this one took a while. Uh, this time Avengers Endgame, which is going to be a bit of a challenge because normally I rewrite stuff that's like widely panned. Uh, I've only done something that's like mildly criticized once before, so uh, wish me luck. <laughs> uh, if you want to skip to the rewrite, go this time. Um, there. Um, but otherwise, uh, I'll start by giving you a quick list of things I'm trying to fix so you know what you're getting into. Uh, then we'll go along and I'll explain the reasoning behind why I think these things are problems and how to fix them as we, you know, get along. So here we go, this is what I'm going to fix. 1. Thanos didn't feel as compelling to me as he did in Infinity War. He felt less grey and more like just a typical evil villain. Uh, two, the fight was with Thanos felt like anticlimactic. Uh, the stones weren't utilised, Thanos wasn't fought at full power, Thor's axe just kind of became an axe. Uh, four, uh, Professor Hulk started the movie as Professor Hulk and didn't have like a moment dedicated for transformation. Uh, five, uh, Captain Marvel didn't feel like she mad as much as she should for her foreshadowing. And six, uh, Thor's arc after his failing in Infinity War didn't feel like it had enough time dedicated to it. All right, uh, and finally two disclaimers. Uh, one, I'm not doing anything with the whole Eternals thing. I know an Endgame video right now is really late, but that doesn't mean it's related to Eternals, which I haven't watched. <laughs> but if I understand correctly, it kind of had like a Thanos retcon. Uh, either way, just dis disregard the la later stuff. Just pretend Endgame's coming out and this is it. What am I doing drinking this? It's not product placement. <laughs> two, uh, two. Uh, if this feels a bit like self-insult torture porn written by Thanos, uh, just remember I'm putting a focus on his dialogue to show how to improve him, as it's what this video is primarily built for. If this was a false script, I'm sure I would add a bit more, you know, dialogue back and forth between characters. Instead, I'm really just showing the dialogue and moments necessary for specific scenes and moments, not what would be naturally included in an actual script. Okay, insecure disclaimer over. <laughs> Something I felt kind of conscious about. All right, begin. Uh, so until we get to the time heist, uh, there's only three small changes I want to make. Uh, firstly, when the Avengers go to kill Thanos for the first time, they arrive to the garden, oh, at the garden, to find there's something weird about the atmosphere. Maybe it's a dense meteor field or uh, some kind of weird alien parasite that eats away at any ship that goes through it. It doesn't really matter. Maybe it's a weird magical space enchantment, but what it means for the story is that once they enter, they won't be able to leave through the atmosphere again. Uh, that's it though. Uh, other than that, this planet is normal. The Avengers don't know why this is, but they posit it might be like a deterrent from trying to get to Thanos. Not for the Avengers though. Uh, Thor, familiar with the enchantment or whatever, says they can bypass it with the uh, Bifrost summoning axe. So after they kill Thanos, this is presumably how they leave. The second change is that Thanos should look more damaged than he did directly after his first snap, like something has happened in between movies. More on that later. The third change I'm making is to keep Professor Hulk as Banner so we can turn him into Professor Hulk at a later point in the movie. Don't get me wrong, a lot of these scenes were funny, but it kind of feels like a waste of a climax. I don't think any of these funny moments had to be in Endgame and could have easily been in a following movie after he'd had the transformation completed. I, I think that's my issue with Endgame actually. It's almost like it doesn't seem to understand it's the ultimate climax of a huge saga and a lot of plot threads and characters that the audience is invested in. I think the vast majority of the movie is good, really entertaining. The time heist, for instance, has a ton of great standalone moments. Tony's heart to heart with his dad, the shenanigans in New York to get the stone, Cap vs. Cap. If this was a standalone Marvel movie, I think it would have been one of the best, but a lot of the big scenes don't have anything to do with what people were excited to see from the last movie the most. And so as a climax, it feels lackluster. Like compare the time heist to the first half of the movie, which I think does amazingly, uh, save for Professor Hulk. I think it does an amazing job of following up on the big things the audience is invested in. This huge thing has happened, the Avengers have lost, and half the universe, including the cast, is dead. And so everything that follows is a natural extension of what the audience is most excited for. 
You see them grieve, wrestle with failure, even fight each other as old wounds come to the surface, and the second they get the chance to track down Thanos and continue the major conflict of the last movie, they do. Only to find there's nothing that they can do except get petty revenge. All the scenes are to play into this. Hawkeye and Thor's depression, Tony's reluctance to risk his daughter on a new plan, Natasha trying to get a sense of control, there's also Scott coming back to the chaos to reunite with his own grown now bleh, his own now grown daughter and bring hope with him to the Avengers. And this directly follows into the challenges of getting the group back together. But a lot of the time heist feels like a fair bit less connected with the conflict and build up and a lot more like arbitrary obstacles that the audience like isn't as invested in. And I think the problem only gets worse as you get out of the time heist as a lot of time is spent on being trapped on the ground and finding the gauntlet. And then after spending a large section of the fight to not give the conflict with Thanos like a lot of weight, but bring the gauntlet through enemy lines to a van to send it back in time. Couldn't this time have been better used to like flesh out the conflict with Thanos and made it more intimate and personal? This character is the cause of all of these amazing scenes at the start. That should mean something to these characters and should be interwoven into the climax as much as their reactions to it were interwoven into the beginning. Even what I felt was addressed like Thor's depression from his massive guilt and failure in Infinity War was dealt with with like a five minute mom pep talk rather than be like a bigger moment with more build up and weight. I mean he's been on this whole arc from being an arrogant prince for like four movies now and now for the first time his arrogance is responsible for irreparable damage that he's had to live with for four years. Like I love how he became a shell of his former self so the path from that shell should have had just as much weight to it. <laughs> I guess it technically did. What about Captain Marvel? She was supposed to be like a game changer since she had the after credit scene and a movie right before Endgame, but she like, she destroys a ship I guess? Rocket had this whole thing in the Guardians movie about learning to not push away the people he loved and then he lost his whole family. The only follow up we saw to this was him holding hands with Nebula. It's it's disappointing to not have seen the reunion moment with him and the Guardians. And then you have Thanos who was not only like didn't have much screen time between him and the Avengers outside the first part of the movie, but it wouldn't have been the same anyway because it was a different Thanos. So all the conflict of emotions, opinions, history, it was all just like lost for the finale. So Professor Hulk, despite making for some good scenes by himself, is kind of just one example in a whole host of similar problems that made Endgame feel like it glossed over a lot of the payoff to a ton of build up. Hulk had a whole big identity crisis and fight with Banner in Ragnarok, and when he was beaten by Thanos, he refused to come out. Uh, that's a big conflict. Co conflict? That's a big conflict with a big potential payoff, and rather than pay off Hulk's return in one big awesome moment, it's it's just kind of already there. Alright, that was kind of a large tangent, but I think it's important to outline why uh, this is the only thing I'm changing in the first half of the movie and why I'm going to go pretty wild as we go on. So, in this new endgame, Hulk has been silent in Banner for years. Banner says that at first he tried everything to make a connection, but then he remembered that since he originally wanted to cure himself of the Hulk, this was the next best thing. Even when he gets stressed or angry, the Hulk doesn't come out anymore. This has actually made him a lot more confident. He's happy and comfortable interacting with others and society, so he's basically the same character in Endgame, just without the Hulk part. This helps us maintain the energy of the jokes, if not the visual component. Actually, maybe you could have Banner become a bodybuilder? <laughs> <laughs> as part of his like self-help journey. It's not as good an irony as like Smart Hulk, but you know, yeah, it's, it's there. Anyway, let's move on to the time heist. So I don't really think I need to pay attention to runtime since this is a rewrite, uh, but for what it's worth, I'd simplify a lot of the time heist because I'm probably gonna blow out the runtime with everything else. Uh, that said, I'd want to keep Cap versus Cap and his Hail Hydra moment intact, and I'd want to streamline Tony through to his father with little hold up. After all, uh, Tony and Cap aren't going to be in future movies, so if anything should be a priority, it should be those scenes. Uh, but other than that, I'd severely cut down the time heist. In fact, I'd really want to make a point of how easy the time heist actually is, with the characters even commenting on it, seemingly being more knowledgeable than they used to be, and making the time heist go very cleanly. Like for instance, uh, let's just cut the Hulk convincing Time Lady and just have her go, yep, here you go, like she's seen the same thing Doctor Strange has already, and Ben is like, well, that was weirdly easy. Oh, also, I should make note of this. I know past Endgame and even technically in Endgame there was a whole idea of one true timeline and then like branching timelines that needed to be controlled. That was kind of cool, uh, but for this to work I'm gonna go more along the lines of a multiverse thing straight away uh, where each choice is its own universe and each time is its own universe. Uh, going back in time is going to a new universe, which is I suppose the same as what it is already. Actually no, it's the exact same. I'm not 
actually going to make use of the fact that each universe has slight differences and Endgame already works on the whole changing the past doesn't change the present thing. So yeah, it's, it's, it's basically the exact same, yeah. So as long as there are billions of universes happening at once in different times, it's fine so long as they're following the same choices so we can keep everything multiverse-wise intact. Anyway, uh, I'd also cut uh, Thor's pep talk with his mum and have him just simply chicken out and later try to summon the hammer while alone. I don't hate this scene, I think it's fine, but I'd much rather he confront his problems with Thanos as he is the source of the problems. It's, it's just kind of like a little anticlimactic, I guess. Anyway, wondering if he's still worthy, he summons the hammer. It works, but instead of being happy, he just asks himself, how am I still worthy? Rocket comes back just as he's saying that, and he quickly covers for it like, oh, of course, of course, I'm still worthy, yes, yes. I'm gonna keep Thor very much in denial for now, at least outwardly. Now, the one time heist I'm gonna edit big time uh, is gonna be Rhodey and Nebula, and by small extension, Hawkeye and Black Widow. I'm gonna have the characters suggest that because Thanos is such a dominant force in space, and because they have to take a journey through space after they drop off Hawkeye and Black Widow, that they should go 300 years prior to avoid running into his forces on the way to their destination. 300 years specifically because it's when the seas of Morag descend and reveal the Power Stone. That's a thing by the way, I don't really expect anyone to remember this, I read a lot of wiki articles for this. They think about going further to completely dodge Thanos, but Rocket and Nebula warn against this because they risk running into the previous space dictator who was in his prime 600 years ago until Thanos knocked him out. Uh, they also just generally have a lot less information about this time and space. Now when we actually get into the time heist, we get a new scene. Rather than be told Space 2014, or even Space 1714, we get Space 1710, four years before the Seas of Morag descend and reveal the Power Stone. And here we get our first new Thanos scene, a scene with a much younger Thanos in the earlier stages of his climb to dominance. We see a younger version of Thanos, not too young, he's apparently like a thousand years old, but he has uh, here like a thinner build and looks more like he's in his late 20s or 30s in human years. He's also thinner and smaller enough that if he were to make a gauntlet for himself, it would coincidentally be small enough to fit one of the Avengers. As convenient as the Iron Man gauntlet is, I think it takes a lot away from the mystique of the, the Star Forge and as a result the idea that the gauntlet and the axe are like big deals in the universe. You know, I think the Star Forge was really just meant as something for Thor to do uh, in Infinity War, but they did like a great job of it, like too great even. By linking into Thanos and giving it amazing spectacle, it just becomes a shame to just throw it away to be like, a oh, magical space forge built around a star, oh yeah, Tony could do that in his garage. Like, <laughs> like if you kept the emphasis on the axe and the gauntlet, your audience is going to be super invested in anything that has the name Nivadelir in future. Anyway, he has significantly smaller forces and is currently inhabiting a moderate sized village on an unnamed planet. As he walks through the village, you can tell he has ingratiated himself with the townsfolk. He talks to and greets each one by name and helps them out as they make last minute preparations for some kind of festival. He lifts and helps them carry heavy things, plays little games and jokes with the children, and offers guidance for decorating and other odd jobs. Eventually, he arrives at a large stone square where townsfolk are starting to gather. Around him, he can see some of his own forces mingling with the townsguard. It seems that they have some kind of partnership, with, or even like friendship, with their forces. They seem to be about equal in number with each other as well. Some of the townsguard express a sadness in not being able to participate in the festival dance, as it seems to be of some kind of cultural significance, but Thanos and his men put them at ease, saying that they've already significantly weakened their enemies together as, and there's nothing to fear. They should join the festival altogether like they did before the war, and leave defense to Thanos and his forces. Most of them, having clearly grown a sense of trust, oblige and join the crowd. After a large crowd has gathered, a village elder calls and makes a motion for them to split the crowd into two lines, and says that the one on the opposite side of them is their partner for the dance. As the two lines slowly step toward each other, a new character steps up to Thanos. By his clothes you can tell he's like Thanos' second in command, I'm just gonna call him, I don't know, Torvax? That sounds kind of spacey. Actually, you could just make this a young Corvus Glaive. That kind of works. I don't know if his species lives that long, but I don't think anything in the MCU currently contradicts it, so yeah. Anyway, Thanos stares at the two lines with the intensity you're not used to with Thanos. He doesn't seem quite as calm and collected. In fact, he grits his teeth and says, 
begin. Corvus speaks something into a receiver and a spaceship flies into the space above the square. The lions come to a sudden stop as they're buffeted by the wind. Thanos' men drop down, point their guns at the line and get them to freeze. And after a brief moment of worried confusion, one line is slaughtered as Thanos stares with the same ferocity. He keeps his eyes affixed on it for some time. The murder, the corpses and the horrified tormented expressions of the people still alive. Corvus looks at Thanos still focusing and says, really soaking in the moment aren't you? You're even more sadistic than I thought. An anger flashes in Thanos' eyes, and he grabs him by the collar. Corvus looks terrified, and it looks like Thanos is about to hurt him, but after a second, he swallows some of his anger and says, I don't watch because I want to. I watch because I should. He swallows the rest of his anger, sets him down, and begins to walk towards the crowd. Alright, so this is my first attempt at replicating the Thanos character from Infinity War. Well, minus the anger, that is. That's something new I'm doing. Which, funny enough, I'm going to use to retcon why the Thanos you see in previous movies is a much angrier character. But to me, what made Thanos so compelling in Infinity War is that his, he has this like really interesting, unique opinion. And not only does he act based on that opinion, everything he does and says indicates he truly believes it. He can explain his philosophy with some level of depth. He can make personal sacrifices for his philosophy, indicating he truly is doing it for selfless reasons. He never revels in the murder of innocents and even sometimes shows some level of respect to the people trying to stop him. Infinity War created a character with a philosophy and then every part of his characterization reinforces the belief in that philosophy. This is why I really love Thanos at the start of Endgame. The fact that he destroyed the stones because they served no purpose for him outside of temptation is like peak Thanos. Like of course he would do that. He's not a maniacal villain who wants to rule the world. He just wanted to, in his mind, save it. He doesn't need these stupid fucking trinkets. Nothing is more important to him than securing the new world he's created, so he destroys them without question, sacrificing any chance he has to be selfish. And that selflessness is one of the traits that really in reinforces his character and something I've tried to replicate here. This is a younger, less experienced Thanos, fresh off the death of his people, who has not yet found a way to accept what he must do, but is compelled to do it anyway. And by forcing himself to watch the life he's taking, he is trying to cope with that guilt. I think the new Thanos in Endgame really only hit this note once, and that was when he sees his own death and smiles, saying, Destiny fulfilled seemingly with no care for his own life. But other than that, I really don't feel the same modesty and genuine desire to make the universe better from him, especially when we get into his main goal, but we'll get to that when we get to it. Now you might say to me, sure, this Thanos has the modesty, but he's also significantly more pussy ass and he doesn't have the same intimidation factor as in Infinity War Thanos, and to that I say, don't worry, I know. Thanos is young and angry for three reasons. One, to make a lesser Thanos uh, to build up to the real one. Two, to keep this Thanos and the one we know more distinctive from each other. And three, to add some more depth to Thanos. A lot of my rewrites are actually very plot twisty, but I'm actively avoiding doing that this time. And that's not to say there aren't twists uh, in this, but I'm trying to avoid radically recontextualizing Thanos' character. The big struggle with this rewrite is like, Thanos is already a completed character, a lot of my rewrites deal with characters that are already broken and no one's going to complain if I inject them with something really big. But Thanos is already perfect in Infinity War so there was a struggle of where do I go with him? If this was uh, like a different kind of story maybe I'd have the snap change his belief somehow and maybe he'd go on like a character journey of regret or denial or something. But Thanos is a big bad, so most of the big changes I can do with him and his character will ruin the satisfying climax that is beating him. So instead, I'm resisting that urge. I'm just going to use this younger, different version of Thanos to give context to some of the smaller characterizations in the present that weren't explained. Particularly, I'm going to explain Thanos' fixation on destiny. Destiny arrives all the same, and now it's here. Or should I say, I am. I want to explain this and show exactly how he gained this mentality for being inevitable, as well as how that was what he needed to transition from this angrier version of himself to the terrifyingly collected, calm, and almost omniscient villain we have in the present. Anyway, after a minute or so, the two move into the square. Most of the people are quietly sobbing as any attempt they make to try and call out or ask why uh, to Thanos have been silenced. Not killed, just like they had a gun pointed at them. Thanos calls to his men to make preparations to leave as the ship lands in the square. Maybe he explains a bit of his usual stick to the townsfolk, I don't know. But they're cut short by something appearing in the center of the square. A familiar black and blue portal like the ones made from with the space stone, but outlined with a bit of green as well. 
but we don't see who comes out of it. Thanos and his men just stare into it with caution before we cut to black and see four years later. Rhodey, Nebula, Clint, and Natasha appear via time travel in the same universe. Rocket and Nebula's plan seemingly has worked. After dropping Clint and Natasha off, Rhodey and Nebula make it all the way to Morag without running into a single enemy. But what they don't expect is despite not having run into any of Thanos' forces on the way to Morag, when they grab the Power Stone and they turn around, they find Thanos himself is right there. Or at least the younger version of him. Not just that, but somehow he's already gotten a much smaller, slimmer Infinity Gauntlet on his hand. No stones though. He says, I don't know who you are or what you plan to do with that, but I guarantee you it serves a greater purpose with me. They try to leave with the time travel, but a younger Ebony Moore, can I do that? Is he, uh, is that his species? Whatever, fuck it. A younger Ebony Moore uses his psychic powers to snatch the stone. You can have a quick fight here, but I'm just gonna gloss over it because Thanos doesn't really know who they are yet, so I don't have a lot of particularly good moments or dialogue to interject. Uh, I would like to take a moment in this fight to characterize younger Thanos as angrier and more ferocious. He doesn't move with clean, calm efficiency. He carelessly drags his balance blade along the ground when he closes the distance. He swings hard and recklessly, yelling, throwing himself at his opponent, throwing them off balance with fear and sheer, sheer strength. He overpowers his opponents at the expense of his own body. He fights Scrappy and comes out with a couple of wounds, but ultimately young Thanos captures them and Ebony Moore grabs the pin particles before they can use them. Wanting to know what they are, Thanos tortures them for information. When this doesn't work, he realizes, similar to the movie, that he can take Nebula apart for information. And it's here that he finds that all of her parts, their programming, how they're put together, are all very recognizable to Thanos as his own work. Between this and the timestamp of 2023, he says, No, I made you. Who are you? Fine, you really want to know who I am? She spits, the pain of being taken apart stricken across her face. I'm your greatest failure. And Thanos pauses for a moment and says, Nebula, in realization. And Nebula's eyes go wide, like how the hell does he know my name? At this point, he discovers the data archive similar to the film and pieces together that they're from the future. Unfortunately, I do have to remove the Destiny Fulfilled line, which I just got done complimenting. I can't make it as badass, but I am going to replace it with this. When young Thanos sees himself acknowledge that the snap has worked and his head gets chopped off, he begins to cry silent tears of disbelief. So it really is true. It really is possible. But when Nebula speaks to mock him, he's reminded that she's in the room and he grabs her by the throat. His expression changes to fury. And you tried to take it all away. So despite this scene focusing Nebula, you'll notice the one big difference I've made here is that Thanos captures both Rhodey and Nebula. This means that he has one Infinity Stone, which means the Avengers can't snap after the time heist is finished. This was honestly the weirdest fucking choice to me. The whole point of the film, reversing the snap, was achieved in the warm, comfy walls of Stark HQ, surrounded by friends with like one enemy in another room that they don't even know about doing something else. It just seems like it has no tension or any dramatic flair to it, which is funny because you can tell that's what they were going for because they build up the snap with like a, we're gonna go into barn door protocol. Snap's very dangerous. Shut all the doors. I'm Iron Man. Let me put the shield up. Oh, I'm Thor. Watch out, rabbit. Stand behind me. It's like, fucking leave. Go outside. You don't need to be in the room. It just feels so artificial, but like, I get the idea. The snap should be something with build up, something the characters struggle for, but it's best achieved when they have to claw it back from the jaws of defeat in the darkest hour, not something they gain without even encountering Thanos. Anyway, from here, Thanos gets information about how to time travel using the pin particle. Rhodey and Nebula have left and puts on a skin tight suit. Actually, no, let's make a couple of changes there. No one wants to see that. So we don't see him put on the suit and also let's change the time gate to have them leave and return in separate rooms that connect to a big center room via hallways. That way, Thanos has a chance to remove the skin tight suit and get back into his usual attire before he sees the Avengers. So when the characters meet in the center room, Hawkeye goes to mention Natasha is dead, but is interrupted by the Avengers realizing no one has come through the hallway to Rhodey and Nebula's room. And then you hear, the sound of a blade dragging across the floor, and a terrifyingly familiar voice echoes from the hallways. Did it comfort you? When you found a way to reverse your problems without even having to face the cause? I hope it did. The sooner you realize there are no easy answers, the sooner you'll realize I'm right. 
says the younger Thanos, stepping into the room. Immediately, Thor jumps across the room, axe at the ready, straight for his neck, lightning and anger in his eyes. But Thanos shouts, if I don't get back, neither do they. Will you kill your friends again, Thor? And Thor stops dead, blade at Thanos' neck, fuming with anger, but also shock written on his face. Rocket says, he's from 300 years in the future, how does he know who we are? Thanos gets closer to Thor and says, did you enjoy it when you cut off the head of an unarmed man? And Thor growls, oh yes, very much so. In fact, I was just about to start a collection. Earth's heroes, he called you. You're not heroes. Every enemy I cut through leaves a bitter taste in my mouth. You parade around like peacocks. He seems kind of angry, says Rocket. I should be. The avoidable death of my people is still fresh in my mind. Perhaps the Thanos you knew wouldn't concern himself with something so petty, but the thought that you tried, with zero sacrifice to reverse a hundred years of dedication, it angers me. Good, it'll make it all the more satisfying than the last you I killed. He didn't even see it coming. You should give him more respect. He called you strong. Though I disagree, he says looking at Thor's body. Oh yeah, what else did Papa Thanos tell you, says Tony. And Thanos says, I thought I already told you there won't be any easy answers. Well, it doesn't matter, you're not taking a single stone from us. No, you'll be giving them to me. Rocket laughs, wow, he used to be funny. And Thanos says, not all of them, just two, the Space Stone and the Time Stone. I'll even give you this one back, he says, flashing the Power Stone. Two for one, that's a terrible trade. Thanos says, the Time Stone only works if you have a target but the Space Stone doesn't need one. You're free to travel to any moment within space and time. Once I use both stones to bring my ship and forces through along with your friends, then we can have a fair fight, he says, looking at Thor. Tony connects the dots. That's how he knows about us. The old Thanos must have used the stones to time travel before he died. This was one of my smaller criticisms. I do not understand why you need these precious pin particles to time travel one individual, but Nebula comes in, hacker modes the computer, and now they can bring through an entire fucking army. It's like directly contradictory to the rules that's set up, but you have the space stone and time stone laying around and like it's not utilized by the story at all. There is a guy called Morgan in his army. He was a great wizard. Thanos was a brilliant genius as well. Those two easily reverse engineered and mass produced pin particles. For a whole army? And a ship? In a day? Alright, whatever. I still feel like they should have mentioned that because it, it was confusing. Anyway, after Tony works out the original Thanos must have time traveled to this young Thanos before he died, Lang says, yeah, but what for? Someone says that maybe he expected them to go back in time, but young Thanos denies it, saying no one could have predicted the Avengers would use such a cheap trick. After a back and forth, Captain America suggests accepting the deal. He confirms with Nebula that he's not a liar, like she said before. The Avengers believe that they can take on him and his army, and it's the only way to save Rhodey and Nebula without risking Thanos' men executing their hostage the second the Avengers try to time travel to them. I think the logic for this is strong enough as is, but if you want to ensure Thanos fulfills his end of the bargain, you can have one of the Avengers go with Thanos with like a blade to his throat or whatever to ensure his end of the deal and only take the blade away once Rhodey and Nebula have been confirmed to be on the ship and a portal has been opened that's big enough to fit the whole ship through. Thor steps aside, keeping his axe at the ready, and lets Captain America trade the space and time stone for the power stone. In the brief lull in conversation as Cap walks to Thanos, Banner asks Hawkeye, where's Natasha? And when he says I'm sorry and explains, Banner begins to hyperventilate, and for the first time in years, the Hulk stirs. Thanos trades the stones as this begins and disappears. Thor resumes his position, ready to decapitate him the second he reappears. But then they begin to notice Banner. They try to calm him down as Hawkeye explains what happened. Thor, however, keeps his position, dead focus. But then outside the window, a portal appears, and through it emerges Thanos' ship. Oh, by the way, I imagine the time room overlooking the lake with a big fuck-off window. The ship hovers in front, a giant laser cannon at the front charges up as the Hulk finishes his transformation and looks up to see Thanos through the window on the bridge of the ship. Your fault, your fault, Hulk smash before he charges and tries to leap through the building window, but the laser fires. It hits Hulk first, stopping him in his tracks, but coincidentally protecting those behind him by deflecting the laser all around them. They huddle up behind Hulk, dangerously close to the laser cone now around them. They try to wait out, but the laser doesn't stop and Hulk is left desperately trying to force his way through. He turns and tries to take it on his shoulder as he continues to try and push against it. 
Cap uses his shield to deflect the stray laser beams while Thor tries to throw his axe and hit the ship through the laser, but is deflected back from the strength of it. Thor is confused why he can't and Rocket says, you uh, think you got time in here for a quick workout? We cut to inside Hulk's mind, some kind of void world for the sake of their internal dialogue. We see Hulk struggling against a laser that doesn't quite seem there and Banner sits on the ground in front of him. He takes a moment to comprehend what he's heard about Natasha, but he turns his frustrations to Hulk. What are you doing? He says. You're not going to overpower it. Are you just going to stand there forever? He's probably using the stones to loop the laser infinitely. But Hulk ignores him. You dumb, angry idiot. We can't just sit here ramming our head into a brick wall. We need another way to disable it. Listen, just get Thor to throw his axe over the... You're not listening, are you? His fault. His fault, says Hulk. Yeah, I know. I'm angry too, which is why you need to listen to me. No. Hulk smash. Banner yells and pulls his hair out in frustration. This is exactly your problem. You don't think, you don't listen, you're nothing but angry and stupid, and it's why you lose everyone and everything you have. No, he struggles. His fault. No, it's your fault. If you were smarter and didn't just throw punches, you would have beaten him before Natasha even had to risk her life. But then Hulk turns on him. No, not Hulk's fault. Banner's fault. If fight need big brain, then you fight. Hulk had to do it. Banner not strong enough. Banner's fault. And Banner stares at him for a second as if processing before clenching his teeth and beginning to tear up, realizing they're equally right about each other. He turns away and after a moment more solemnly says, Maybe I am too hard on you. He sits down and starts to mumble to himself. But what do you expect? Both of us have been a walking disaster since we got to New York. I mean, how, how could we possibly work? I'm smart, you're strong, I'm calm, you're angry, you're reckless, I'm cautious. I like nuclear physics, you like smashing. We have nothing in common. I hate you, and you hate me. But, but then Hulk says, Natasha. For the first time, Hulk says her name, and something dawns on Banner. Oh, he says. He turns around and starts walking back towards him. Hey, hey! He walks up to Hulk trying to get his attention, but when it doesn't work, he grabs his head and he looks into his eyes. Yeah, you know what? You're just a blockhead and I'm just a weakling. We both hate each other, but you know what? And he pulls him closer. Despite everything, we have one single thing in common. We both loved her. For the first time, Hulk looks him in the eyes. You're in pain, aren't you? If you let me in, I'll share it with you. And for the first time, Hulk's eyes soften. He looks at Banner and finally sees himself. We'll mourn her together. We come back to reality. Banner has the side of his face in the laser. He turns around instinctively, taking the laser on his back before looking at his body and realizing he's become Professor Hulk. With not a moment to lose, he snaps into action. He tells Thor to throw him the axe and Cap to throw him the ball that contains the power stone. He catches both and asks Tony what material the roof is made out of. He then takes a second to eyeball the trajectory and distance before he chucks the axe upwards at an angle, sending it through the roof and over the ship. He counts in his head. One, two, three, four before he shouts to Thor, pull it back now. Thor does so and the axe rips through the body of the ship from behind, taking out the laser cannon on its way. The laser itself now reduced to just a beam of light that spotlights Professor Hulk as he leaps into the air and through the bridge of the ship. Professor Hulk dramatically lands in front of Thanos who looks at him in defiance. Thanos' top soldiers surround him. He says, as I've heard, you're the type to jump into the middle of the enemy lines with the exact thing your enemy is looking for. That was stupid, he says. And Hulk says, not stupid, and crushes the orb, balling a fist and letting the dangerous energy of the power stone course through him. Calculated risk, he says, before firing a devastating punch that sends Thanos through and out of the ship, falling to the ground. Hulk follows him to the ground but can only grab the time stone from the gauntlet before Thanos uses the space stone to teleport a short distance away and regain his composure. So in general I love the whole concept of the soul stone and how it requires a sacrifice, specifically for Thanos because it did so much for his character uh, that it was worth killing Gamora. But when it comes to the time heist, while it makes sense why one of the Avengers would need to die, it still doesn't feel like it's worth it from a story standpoint. I saw this problem as well as the fact that Professor Hulk didn't have a moment and I'm like, Bruce canonically has a thing for Natasha, Hulk canonically has a thing for Natasha, 
I can fix both these problems at once. From here, half of the Avengers join the fight on the ground against young Thanos, while half the fight to take control of Thanos' ship, which is providing air support. Half of Thanos' men also join the fight on the ground too. With only the Space Stone at his disposal, Thanos plays evasively, but Thor does not. Finally, he's got his chance to take out all of his anger on Thanos, but instead, Thanos uses this to bait Thor into attacking him to create a portal in front of him and teleporting him away. Thanos then disappears with the stone himself. Thor finds himself in some dramatic location befitting of a duel as Thanos appears ahead of him. Thor, of course, revels in this opportunity to get revenge personally and tells Thanos he's smart to fear him, to fight him alone. But Thanos says he doesn't fear him, he's just wary of the axe as he was told it was specifically made to beat him. To Thor's surprise, he finds he actually lacks the strength to beat him, and Thanos mocks him for it. A weapon designed to beat a version of me 300 years more experience and yet you still fail. A dumbfounded Thor says, no, no, I could, I could beat you, I just, I just, I just lack the strength right now. You lack resolve, that's how you lost the strength. Let's say Thanos had grabbed the Mind Stone at this point, and after he beats up Thor, he uses it on Thor to read his mind and see if he knows how to time travel. After a very short fight, a portal opens up on the main battlefield and a bloody and beaten Thor is kicked through it. Thanos walks in after. You're fortunate this universe is already balanced. The only ones that need to die here are the ones who know how to time travel without the stones. Be grateful, he spits. Few live to be thankful of their own stupidity. This covers the character moments for this scene, I'll just gloss over how I'd plan out this fight, but there's a lot you can do. In the heat of combat, stones keep switching hands and this changes how the fight plays out, as well as give our heroes a secondary objective to give it a lot of franticness. He could gain most of the stones at the start by using the divide and conquer strat with the space stone to drive the tension, but then at the table's turn once they find a counter strategy and grab a few back. Like maybe we can get the introduction of the Iron Man Infinity Gauntlet and Professor Hulk and Iron Man use it with the reality stone to trick Thanos into thinking he's divided and conquered Hulk, only for it to be an illusion with the reality stone and Hulk has taken the space stone right from under it. I know I said not to take away from the mystique of Nibbadalir and I still stand by that. Uh, you can have Tony take one stone uh, in the heat of battle and start trying to tinker with the uh, with a gauntlet design using the nanotech, trying to find a way to stabilize the power of the stone. When he gets it working, he chucks it to Hulk because he's most able to use it, but he also warns him specifically to only ever use it with one stone. Otherwise, it'll kill him. This will set up our final moment and tell us ahead of time what him using his own gauntlet with all the stones means for him. Despite getting a bunch of stones at the start, I never want this fight to feel like the Avengers have been pushed to their limit. Just a good strategy that forces them to use a counter strategy. Cause this, this is just a warm up fight. But I feel like this among other things fixes an issue I had with Endgame. One of the things I liked about Infinity War was how all the different stones played into fights with Thanos and the moments with him. He gets the Power Stone and he fucks up the Hulk. He gets the Space Stone and he starts traveling all over the place. He gets the Reality Stone and everything gets like tricky and also like fun. In Endgame, they're more treated like, like a match set of MacGuffins with no purpose but to snap. Anyway, this fight ends when the Avengers land a heavy wound on young Thanos, but in the process, young Thanos manages to grab the Soul Stone and the Space Stone without them noticing. Tony says, give it up, you are never gonna stop us. And Thanos says, you're arrogant, Stark. But am I wrong? No, you're right. It's 300 years too early for me to try and take all the stones from you. But that's okay. Because I know who can, he says before flashing the stones. I only ever needed two. Using the space stone, Thanos disappears, leaving them to wonder where he went and why. But Hawkeye can only come up with one theory from his experience getting the soul stone. The soul stone clearly doesn't have the power to restore life. But maybe it can trade it. A soul for a soul. It may be possible for young Thanos to trade his life for the original with the Soul Stone. We change scene to see a bleeding Thanos limp his way to a mound of dirt in the garden where the plants seem less grown. He sits down in front of it and activates the Soul Stone as he speaks. I promised myself I'd not return to this place until the work was done. I suppose I failed. But you, you actually did it. You deserve this garden more than anyone and yet you accepted your death as if it were nothing. But death was not your destiny, it was mine. He raises the gauntlet, preparing to snap. The soul stone shines. You are inevitable. Snap. And suddenly, we're in the red realm of the soul stone. He walks up to the pedestal. A young Gamora stands there. Where is he? 
She nods and begins to walk off. He follows. As she walks, people begin to appear out of thin air, but their faces are obscured by, like, an impossible shadow. They murmur things. Menial things. How are you? Are you free later? I'll have a cappuccino, thanks. Just random moments from life, but they repeat them over and over. Sometimes, like, they're not quite sure what's going on. I'll have a cappuccino, thanks. I'll have a cappuccino, thanks. I'll have a cappuccino, thanks. And then the number of people starts to grow exponentially, and the lines start to change. Where'd he go? What's happening? Dust? They lost. Oh god, they lost. They're practically swimming in people by the time they reach a clearing with something at its center. The silhouette of Thanos, sitting with his back to them. He doesn't seem to be immune either. He says, Gamora. My Gamora. Gamora. My Gamora. Gamora walks over and sits in his lap. He seems to instinctively hold her lightly, but he doesn't seem to be aware of her. Younger Thanos tells him about time traveling and the Avengers and the plan to reverse the snap, but he just keeps saying, Gamora. My Gamora. When he gets frustrated with this, he moves around to the front and asks Gamora to wake him up. The work isn't done, but there's no response. His soul wants to stay, says Gamora. And what of his mind, he says, getting angry and grabbing her by the arm to pull her up. She yelps in pain and suddenly the older Thanos grabs him by the arm. He pulls closer, wraps his hands around his throat and chokes the life from him. As the life drains from his face, shadows start to envelop him and shadows at the edge of the older Thanos' face begin to recede. When the younger Thanos sees this, he starts to smile, knowing he's brought him back. Even though the shadows have receded, let's say for the sake of build-up that we don't see a camera angle that shows us Thanos' face yet, just to line up the Avengers and the audience so that they see him again at the same time. Anyway, a silent Thanos goes to Gamora and holds her hand. He tries to, to walk away with her, but she holds back. I can't go with you, she says. I'll find a way. I'll come back for you. And if you lose? Thanos looks at all the people around him, shadows obscuring their face, a lost shell of what they once were. And he pats Gamora on the head. Then I'll come back for you all the same. This was another one of those scenes that felt like it should have been built on an endgame. The world after the snap is weird and mysterious. This new scene also tells you about how the people who were snapped aren't quite dead as much as they're in the Soul Stone. The same with people who have used or are involved with the Soul Stone like Thanos and Gamora. This Oops. This is what I said to myself before I realized a soul stone with Gamora in it, it was destroyed. This is a new soul stone, so instead I'm going to say the soul stone creates a portal to the dead. Gamora, as the one who is used to make the soul stone, is the only one anywhere near conscious, albeit she is in a childlike form. I like this because it gives you a more satisfying route to bring Gamora back, potentially. Rather than bring back a lesser version of herself without any of the experiences, you can say she's still inside the soul stone and it's possible to get her back. But you have to trade life that's equally important. The Soul Stone is like an engine that you fill with life in order to use. To get someone out, you have to trade something of equal importance. This could mean sacrificing yourself, or a single friend, or possibly thousands of strangers, or millions of enemies. I like Gamora's death only for what it does for Thanos, so to me, it doesn't take away from the story for the Avengers to eventually bring her back. But we can also add consequence to it in the house so that it doesn't feel cheap either. Anyway, we flash back to the grave. Young Thanos disappears into dust. A slimmer Infinity Gauntlet drops onto the ground. For a few seconds, everything is silent. A storm begins to stir in the sky. You hear one burst of thunder, two bursts of thunder, and on the third, the original Infinity Gauntlet bursts from the ground. So this was one of the big ones. Despite the killing of Thanos being really plot twisty and good characterization for him, I don't think killing him to bring back a past self was a good idea. It's easy to use a clone or a past variant of a character and think you've gotten away with a character death without having to actually sacrifice a character, but unfortunately how we interact with characters doesn't seem to work that way. It's true in a technical sense, it is that character, but investment is about association, not technical canon accuracy. This character by proxy is associated with the moments that made us invested in him, yes, but you know who we're more invested in? The character that's actually been the one who's done those things. In this new Thanos' case, the fight just doesn't seem quite as personal. You know that they don't have the same interactions or moments in the past, which to be fair is utilized for jokes. But as a climax for a saga, it just feels lackluster. All this history, all this investment, it only half applies to this character. I honestly felt a lot more excited for the interactions with Thanos at the start of the film than the one at the end. Gamora, I think, is even worse, because now it feels like we have to backtrack her character progression, and even then the genuineness of those original moments is going to be lost. I know there's a stigma around bringing back characters from the dead, but also I think you've got to weigh up the cost of doing things realistically as well. 
And when it's a villain and not the end of the movie and you've got a good underutilized thing like the Soul Stone, fuck it, bring him back. I want to fight with real Thanos, not fucking counterfeit Thanos. Anyway, in the desperate hope that young Thanos will be unable to find the body, they rush to the garden, but they're too late. And when they enter the atmosphere, a portal rushes up to meet the ship. Unable to dodge, the ship goes through it, and they come out near the ground where the portal opens back up, forcing them to crash land. Oh, quick note, I should mention Cap says the Avengers should keep the stones on them. Uh, they consider hiding the stones, but because Thanos has the Space Stone and presumably half of his army and his ship somewhere in the universe, they don't want to give Thanos a reason to use a Space Stone to send his forces to Earth to look for the stones, or even just go there himself and circumvent the Avengers completely. Earth isn't safe if Thanos has any reason to leave with the Space Stone. We see Thanos' back as he sits close to the crash wreckage, waiting. He's already wielding the armor we see in the movie, and we see him open up a portal, put his hand inside, and pull out his own balance blade, a much larger version of the one that his younger self was using. The Avengers exit the wreckage and make their way to Thanos, and we get our classic scene from the movie as we finally see our original Thanos' face. You could not live with your own failure. Where did that bring you? Back to me. The only difference is that it's on the garden, and it's all the current Avengers minus Captain Marvel versus Thanos rather than just these three. Yeah, I'm gonna make it 1v6, uh, which is a great way of demonstrating how dominating a character is rather than put half the Avengers under a pile of rubble, but goddamn, I nearing cringy self insert fan fiction written by Thanos, but whatever, bear with me, it'll make sense. <laughs> Honestly, I keep thinking the lines I'm writing are cringe because, like, I'm like trying to make it badass. But then I'm like, I mean, it can't be that hard. I remember Thanos said this, and it's like, it's like without the voice and the context, this is literally an r slash atheist line. <laughs> it goes to show there's no like inherently cringy line. It's all context. Well, context and performance, I guess, actually. Because like the voice acting is like a big thing. In it. Anyway. Anyway, after the back to me line, here's where the changes come back. So... I don't like this Thanos. As I said before, what I felt makes Thanos so compelling is that he seems to genuinely believe he's doing the right thing. But what he says in this scene really makes it hard to like believe that. Thanos says that since the survivors of the snap have gone back in time to reverse it, it means taking away half of all life will always be meaningless because it'll always get reversed, which is fair logic. But then he says instead, I'm gonna wipe out all of life and then make a new universe. I'm sorry. It it's hard to think you're acting in the interest of, like, like the greater good if your solution to help people is to kill all of them and then make some new life instead. Isn't the snap technically only a temporary measure anyway? Like, in a couple of millennia, are you going to have to come back and kill 100% of all life again and make another universe? It's, it's just kind of unbelievable. I think it's quite telling that, like, when Infinity War came out, there was a group of people who unironically, well, semi-unironically, agreed with Thanos and made communities for it. I also remember seeing a ton of debate in general, even, like, amongst my friends. But, but no one did this with this plan in Endgame. It wasn't even, like, a question that this new plan was in the wrong. It just felt like it crossed the line from ethically grey to what the fuck is the point of this from a moral standpoint. Like, Thanos from the What If series, who changes his mind completely on the snap just because he's convinced of a better alternative, feels so much more in character to me than the official canon does. He went from what was characterized as this very interesting, compelling, ethically grey antagonist who genuinely seemed to want to improve lives to, like, a delusional villain who really wanted, really wanted an excuse to snap his fingers. I get the intention, they were going to try and like raise stakes from the last movie, and so Thanos needed to become even more of a threat than before. This has merit, but I think it's just the wrong way to do it. So here's my take on what Thanos' new plan should have been, and what I've been building up to with a lot of the mysteries so far that I've set up. So when Thanos says, where did that bring you, back to me, Tony says that we know you went to the past. The first thing we do after we beat you is go back and check what you did, so you might as well tell us why now. Thanos exhales contemplating it, and then he looks up. The wizard, he says. He could have destroyed the stone well before I got to it, and yet he gave it up for a single life. That made me suspicious. So before I destroyed the stones, I investigated it, experimented. In the end, I never found out why, but I found something else. It must be overwhelming to learn that infinite universes exist beyond ours. It makes you feel insignificant, doesn't it? Just a drop in the bucket. How could one hope to make an impact in the grand infinity of the cosmos? But when I found out, my mind was overwhelmed by an entirely different thought. 
And what was that? The work wasn't done. This to me feels much more in line with Thanos. If he found out infinite universes existed beyond ours, his only thought would be, there are still more people suffering and I have to save them all. I have to snap every single universe. At first, the Avengers are horrified, but the smarter ones pipe up. They saw how damaged he was after one snap, so he can't have done it multiple times. Furthermore, he says he can't possibly have done that to infinite universes. That's impossible, they say. He says, it had challenges, like any other problem, but impossible? Hmm. I found two universes where I failed, and I snapped them. But you're right, that was my limit. So then, I went to three other universes and shared with the versions of me there who had not yet succeeded all the intel I had, and then I told them to do the same after they fulfilled their destiny. You started a chain, one that would expand infinitely until every universe was balanced. It's regrettable you worked out how to time travel, but once I'm finished here, I'll go back and tell them to deal with you before you can become a problem. That's insane, they say. And Thanos says, it's consistent. I gave one universe salvation, why would I stop while I know people still suffer? That's your problem. Too much, too far. You concern yourself with arbitrary numbers on what is too much to lose rather than measuring it against what is to gain. We draw the line at gaining it through blood, says Cap. And Thanos shakes his head. You lie to yourself. We must all make sacrifices. And it's time for you to make yours. Fight begin! At first glance, the battle seems dire for Thanos. It's 1v6, but the Avengers are weak from their last fight, Thor especially is only back on his feet. And not only that, but Thanos has the Space Stone, intel on their weaknesses, and most of all, they're rusty. Even among the ones who stayed heroes, they have gone years without a real threat. The only exception is Ant-Man, whom no years have passed for and is just as strong. But he's slow and Thanos evades him and the Hulk with the Space Stone until he can take the others out. Like, for instance, he disables Hawkeye, Rhodey, and Rocket by opening portals and making them accidentally shoot their team. These are just going to be some sort of vague ideas for a fight. I don't want to script a whole fight because I don't think it's like the difficult part of writing Thanos, but it is an action movie, so I want to give some direction for some spectacle, so it's not just it, they punch each other. But generally, the point is to demonstrate how the Avengers have been weakened by their four-year break. Also, uh, very early on in the fight, Thanos gets a hold of Thor's axe. He tries to destroy it with a power stone, but he realizes that he can't, as it was built to beat the gauntlet. So instead, he just drops it through a portal as far away as possible, like the other side of the universe. You might notice the main reason I'm doing this is to make sure Thor has only one weapon so that Cap had never has an excuse to use Molnir. I'm saving that moment for when it can really matter. You can also assume that whenever Thor is down, Cap is down too, so this save isn't possible yet. It's difficult at first, but one by one Thanos snatches back each stone, and each time he gets stronger and stronger until he recollects the space stone after losing it, and he finally has them all. They make a mad dash to stop him, but they're too late. Thanos activates the space stone and time stone together, and leaves to tell the younger version of himself to lock down the time travelers. Cap riles everyone up, saying it's not over yet, Thanos must come back, otherwise nothing stops the Avengers from just time traveling again to get more stones. And he does, but with six infinity stones, he's too strong. The last moment of the fight is when he waits for Thor to charge up his lightning before he uses the space stone to open a giant portal to the ocean and flood the battlefield, causing Thor's lightning to hit everyone. Perhaps we get a shot where they're all in knee-high water trying to recover from the shock with the exception of Iron Man, because he built a counter for that in like a previous movie. So instead, Thanos opens a portal, reaches his hand in, and pulls out the electromagnet similar to the one that Quill used on both Tony and Thanos in Infinity War. He uses it and locks up Tony just before he can reach him. I took note of that contraption four years ago when it was used on me. You had four years to build a countermeasure to it yourself, and yet here you are, no different to then. He picks up Iron Man by the throat as Captain America and Thor recover first and close the gap, saying they haven't lost yet, but they're quickly repelled. You lost four years ago when you gave up, he retorts. He presses down on the metal around Iron Man's neck and it begins to crumple as he says, I had respect for you, but for someone that calls himself Iron Man, you bend like gold. Well, we can't all be maniacs with a god complex, he struggles to say. I'm no god, Stark. He manages to break free and pushes himself back a few feet. Stark says, oh please, anyone who says they're destined for anything has a god complex. He sighs. I was like you once, you know. Angry, guilty, hesitant. 
That's why I failed back then to save my people, and why you fail now. Do you know why I believe in destiny? Because when you do, you shed that which stops you. The attachments, the guilt, the anger, the hesitation. So you chose to believe in destiny, yet yeah, you're delusional. Well, I didn't believe it at first. But when you've conquered as many planets as I have, you see the same problem and the same suffering again and again. But because of that, it's inevitable you run into the same prophet proposing the exact same solution. I eventually did, and I realized that it didn't matter if I hesitated or felt guilty. If I failed, another would arise and destiny would arrive all the same. And when you believe in destiny, you shed that which stops you. When you believe in destiny, you become destiny. Thanos takes a space stone out of the gauntlet and pinches it between his fingers. That's why I'm willing to do the things you never could. It's just a pity, it's not a very balanced number, is it? Five infinity stones. The power stone glows as he presses down and smashes the space stone into dust. Then he throws the dust into the air, charges the reality stone and turns that dust into nothing. The Avengers are devastated, with no more pin particles to time travel, no way back to Earth, and no way to snap half the universe back, they are truly fucked. After a moment he walks up to Iron Man who gets ready to fight for his life, but then he walks past him. The water drains away as he walks past each nervous Avenger in turn. The garden is revealed and Thanos sheds his armor to pick up a pitchfork stabbed into the ground. He walks past Thor who says, so that's it? You're not gonna kill us? You're just gonna run back off to your ridiculous gardening? Needless violence. The work is done and your solution is dust, he says. You will stay with me until the snap has begun to spread exponentially through the other universes, and then even you won't be able to control it. Even if you time travel again and bring your people back, another Thanos will inevitably arrive to snap this universe again. Until then, you will stay here with me. Thor gets angrier and angrier until he reaches up to some of the axe. He stares at Thanos in defiance and Thanos looks back at him. But if you hold that axe again or do anything to betray my trust, I will turn your blood and bone into fertilizer. Thor stares back, maintains his position, waiting for the axe, but then he sees Iron Man looking at him. He puts a single finger up, mirroring Doctor Strange as if to say, I've got one shot. Frustratedly, Thor grits his teeth, stops himself and screams into the sky. Lightning pours down and sets the garden on fire. He looks at it and laughs. Oh look, your precious garden up in flames. I guess now you know what it's like to lose everything you love too. God only knows this is all you've ever cared about. But Thanos just walks away, carrying his pitchfork. A frustrated Thor storms off towards the forest. You see where I wanted to cut down the time heist? With the gravity of the whole climax, I really wanted to have a darkest hour. Smashing the space stone was like the best way to do that to me. And maybe you can predict how I'm gonna pull out the win from this uh, with what I've set up. Also, no, it's not to use the time stone to reverse it. In fact, I'd like to have the Avengers minus Tony who's keeping his plan secret float this possibility at some point just to clear it off the table. Notably, the thing was crushed into dust and then into nothing with the reality stone, so you wouldn't really have anywhere to point the time stone, which is consistent with how it's already been used and also, according to young Thanos, is a rule that specifically applies to it. The time stone needs a target. The other reason I wanted to do this is I wanted to have some downtime to actually have a proper conversation with Thanos. Look, I know it's an action movie, but I feel like with such a grey villain it was a waste not to have these characters fight Thanos on an ethical level as much as a physical level. I'd love to see Banner and Tony debate the ethics and feasibility of the snap over a campfire. I doubt they'd actually voluntarily hang out with him while staying at the garden, but maybe Thanos makes alcohol in this month, gets drunk and is like, I'm gonna dress this motherfucker down. An actual debate on the snap at first glance seems hard to write, because realistically the snap is fucking stupid, at least from an economics perspective, which would be my angle. There are some videos on that, but just because something's stupid in real life doesn't mean it has to be in the story. Despite how Banner and Tony may argue it, Thanos can point to the planets he's balanced as pretty absolute proof that it improves life. And he can even ask them to question if life was actually getting better on Earth, which they'll deny at first, but Thanos will talk it out of them. I think the whole concept of the snap works a lot better if it actually works. Thanos is written in such a way where he has no reason to create conflict if it doesn't. And this idea of killing half the population so that the other can live creates this fantastic trolley problem type question that makes him feel like a horrifyingly grey but ultimately understandable villain. But Endgame gets kind of scared with the ethics. They're willing to have Thanos say that this worked for other plants, but the Avengers themselves never even talk about if the snap made life better for them on Earth outside of whales in the Hudson, I guess. 
Which feels like a shame, because even if you accept that the snap works, there are ways you can still argue against it. And I think both Steve and Tony could even have like a rare agreement on the idea that humanity should have had the freedom to face the problem themselves. In fact, this would be a great way for them to get fully over their beef with each other and meet each other on a common ground. Steve believes in the freedom of humanity to choose their fate when overpopulation becomes a problem, and Tony would no doubt believe in humanity's infinite potential for innovation and technological growth that he thinks would have solved the problem of overpopulation early so that it would never have even needed a snap. Maybe Titan was just full of idiots that didn't know how to problem solve, they don't know. <laughs> in this scene, I want Tony to say to Thanos, you really like to congratulate yourself, don't you? Cursed with knowledge, you said. Look at me. You are nothing like me. You call killing half of all life a solution. That's not a solution. It's an admittance of failure. You're the guy in the project team who wants to go back to the drawing board or tell the client it's too hard. I've met loads of people like you. Of course, not as many as you though. If killing half the population was the best your plant could come up with, then it must have been nothing but dime a dozen idiots like you. Thanos will obviously say something like how Iron Man doesn't want to admit there isn't a better solution and believe me, I've tried to think of one, I'm just the only one willing to accept that there isn't and then to act on it, etc. Regardless, remember this line by Tony, I'd give it like a lot of emphasis in the movie. Anyway, all of this allows us to leave the ethics of the snap as an open question to keep the characters intact, but also allows you to have the characters have this conflict on a philosophical level as well as at the same time allowing our characters to bond over it. I wanted to feel for the early part of the movie that the Avengers, save for a few characters, are a broken unit. They're rusty, some feel guilty, some have bad blood with each other, their teamwork has gone to shit, but as we gear up for the final fight in this month long downtime, they find their flow, rekindle their friendships, and remember their teamwork. Steve and Tony have this little moment, maybe Rocket and Nebula talk about their experience with Gamora and how it differs between them, maybe Ant-Man, one of the newest Avengers, can start to strategize on how to use his abilities to work as a team with the others, and the Avengers as a whole take time to to mourn Natasha with a funeral pyre and promise to stay strong for her. Professor Hulk encourages them on this by saying that even in those four years she never stopped trying to help people, so we shouldn't either. It was also important to replace the scene since it's been too hectic since the time heist to mourn Natasha. She's not coming back. Neither is whoever that bench hits. There's also Thor, who we'll get to in a bit. Uh, there was actually one thing I wanted to include in this, but I felt like it was a bit it was getting a bit gratuitous, so I'm not sure anymore. I'd like to come up with a conversation with Thanos about why he chose this planet, seeing as it's impossible to leave. And he says, With destiny fulfilled, I fear I may become weak. If the me from the past comes back, the guilt, the attachments, I fear I may try to find a way to reverse my choice. The garden is basically a prison he put himself in by choice, just in case. Not that it's against what he wants, of course. He still enjoys the simple life and hopes that with the notoriety his name has brought that maybe one day a survivor of Titan will find him and he can restore his people to his former glory. But he's content staying here. The only reason he'd want to leave is if he changed his mind. Is that weird? I, it just kind of got squeezed out of the script over time until it became an afterthought, but, but maybe it does a bit to humanize him. I don't know, tell me in the comments. Oh, but this is also the reason that Thanos smashes the space stone specifically. He doesn't want the option to leave the planet. Meanwhile, between the despair and fireside conversations, Tony has a plan, but he needs to get the message out. He starts sneaking away little bits of scrap from the wrecked ship and working on them in secret to make a transmitter. It's also kind of tempting to have him uh, also make an Iron Man suit in secret. We could say he lost a ton of nanobots in the fight, and he can only use them in conjunction with the suit rather than just as a whole suit. This could be a great throwback to the origins of his character that's well suited for a final fight. You could also show how much smarter or at least more experience he's gotten with the suit, because despite it being in much the same position he was in Iron Man, he can make a much more advanced suit much more quickly. Anyway, Tony finishes what he was trying to do and sends a message into deep space. It's then he tells Rocket and Nebula to find Thor. He's been missing a whole month now and they need him back. If Thanos finds out he sent a message, they're going to need backup. Nebula and Rocket search the forest outside the garden and eventually track him down, and he is ripped. Back to normal. When did you last take a break? says Rocket. I didn't, replies Thor, still doing push-ups. This was one of the more interesting criticisms of Endgame. A lot of people, myself included, didn't like Fat Thor, or at least him fighting in the final battle as Fat Thor. I actually love seeing what his fuck up in Infinity War led to and how he spiraled, but to not get out of that before the final battle? Eh, 
it's easy to pass off this criticism as like, you just don't like fat people, but it's more about spectacle. Humans like extremes. We come to sports to see peak physical performance. Why would we not still want it in our action movies? Everyone being fucking jacked makes it more extreme and therefore cooler, and I think that's really all there is to it. I understand some people like this aspect because it shows he is like not yet over his trauma, but I think there's a better way of showing it that doesn't sacrifice the spectacle. Mainly this. When Thor says he hasn't taken a break, Nebula says, you're punishing yourself. Thor denies this, but Nebula pushes. Every time I lost a fight with my sister, I'd lock myself in the training quarters for days. You're doing the same thing. Thor softens at this. Nebula actually understands what he's going through. He stops working out. I wasn't ready. I had four years and I wasn't ready because I didn't believe because I was too busy feeling sorry for myself. And now the opportunity is gone forever. His voice quivers and it's clear he's racked with guilt as his tough exterior starts to break down. I'm sorry. I got everyone killed four years ago, and when the opportunity came up to save them, they stayed dead because of me. Thor finally admits, I failed, as a single tear falls from his real eye. Rocket tries to comfort him. Hey now, I, I, look, I, I lost my whole... Th the point is I don't blame you. We all failed. There may still be a chance, says Nebula. Stark has a plan, but if Thanos finds out, we're going to need everyone and a completely defeated Thor, even back to his original strength, says, I'm sorry, I can't beat him. But Nebula goes right through him. No, you don't know that. You're just scared of failing. What? says Thor. You're an entitled prince who's never had to pick himself back up in his life. More defensively, he's like, I've gotten back up plenty of times. Thanos is just... And she's like, no, I don't believe you. Prove to me you failed before. Thor thinks for a second and then pops out his eye. I lost to my sister, he says. Pick myself back up after that. And Nebula just scoffs at this. That's it, she says. She sits down and then one by one she starts disconnecting parts of her body, explaining each one as she goes. Most are parts that were replaced after fighting with Gamora, but sprinkled in are a bunch of different fights on different planets against different opponents, where she lost human parts in the fight itself and then they had to be replaced. A finger there, an arm, a leg, eye, a bunch of nerves here, muscles, bones. She keeps going until what sits before Thor is a smorgasbord of different robotic parts and Nebula is just this amputated mess with the only metal on her being the foundational connectors that her metal parts plug into. She says, you're a prideful person, that's why you're scared of losing, but I've been doing it for years. There's pride in failure too. Thor stares for a second, thinks, and then takes a deep breath. A king without scars is no true king, he says to himself. And Nebula smiles. Meanwhile, the garden has grown to a point where it started to encroach on the crashed ship, and Thanos says that he's going to start salvaging and organizing parts. Tony, realizing he might notice the parts he's salvaged, says he'll help just so he can throw him off the case. Maybe he spins some bullshit about, like, starting to get Thanos' point of view just for fun. That could be that could, that could be good, actually. Because you could, like, see Thanos having a friendly conversation with someone for once, a bit like the, the What If series. Actually, you know that scene in Metal Gear Rising Revengeance when Armstrong thinks Raiden has, like, come around to his side and then he, like, picks him up and dusts him off and is all, like, chummy with him? Yeah, like that. As they grab stuff from the ship, Tony sneaks away to where the receiver he took used to be located in the ship and he collects some dust and spreads it in the gap where the component used to be. When Thanos notices it's gone and gets suspicious, Tony makes an excuse. Well, this was a salvage wreck to begin with, it never had that component. See, if it was removed recently, it wouldn't be dusty. Thanos contemplates this, but then says, If you've got nothing to hide, then let me use the Mind Stone to see what you actually think. Tony gets frantic with his excuses as he tries to back up until Thanos launches at him. Quickly Stark uses the new suit he's been working on, carefully is skewered by his clothes, and blasts back first out of the ship to get away. You took it. But why, says Thanos. We switch back to Thor. All of a sudden an explosion can be heard and birds fly from the canopy as you hear the telltale signs of the Infinity Gauntlet. A fight has begun. Thanos has found out. Thor raises his hand to the sky and summons the axe. By the time Thor gets there, most of the Avengers are down, but not dead. Thanos is about to finish off Captain America, who's been protecting everyone from a fatal bow, but Thor arrives in the nick of time to save Cap. Tony is still up. He says he can't let Thanos read his mind. In fact, the others have been holding him off just so he can. Thor tells Nebula, Rocket, and Tony to help the injured. He will handle Thanos. He's no longer cocky. In fact, he's nervous. His hand shakes, but he's determined. And so begins a duel where Thor, finally back to his original strength, can now extract the full power from the axe. 
Again, this was a really surprising choice to me. The axe was built up the whole movie as the Thanos killer. It was made to beat the gauntlet, it was made by the same guy as the gauntlet, and at the end of the movie it cut through a full blast from the gauntlet fully charged. This all creates build up for like a battle of titans, a true climax of spectacle, but in Endgame it's just, it's just kind of an axe. <laughs> so here you go, proper goal, duel. To put it on par with the Infinity Gauntlet, I think this should be able to cut through things like the space portals and the false realities, which could make for some cool moments as he cuts off portals by throwing the axe preventing Thanos from moving about or like getting items. I could imagine a scene where Thor jumps at him and opens a portal to like a derelict spaceship that like fly up at him like giant projectiles. He dodges and runs down them to Thanos before throwing the axe to cut the portals off and cut the projectile spaceships off. Thanos could use the reality stone to try and trick him, but when he catches on he rends the fabric of space time with it like a giant swing. This would work similarly for the mind stone. Maybe the time stone works on Thor and he can hold him in place or reverse time uh, on him if he's not holding the axe, but all he needs to do is hold the axe or summon it to return the flow of time. This all results in him closing the distance and having an all out brawl with Thanos with the power stone being the only thing that really works. But in this, he starts to lose. As strong as the axe is, he can't land a hit and he begins to take punch after punch until he's knocked back and admits solemnly to everyone, I'm sorry everyone, I can't beat him. And Tony says, you don't have to, you just have to stall him. And Thor chuckles in relief and says, I think I can do that. Thor proceeds to get his ass beat for like five minutes, but he doesn't give up. He finally gets thrown onto his back and pushed into a sword lock with Thanos, and he's about to be overpowered before out of nowhere Thanos is hit hard by something. It's Captain Marvel. Together, Marvel and Thor power into him, putting him on the defensive, and before he realizes it, all five stones are gone from the gauntlet. When he looks up, he sees Captain Marvel is wearing the gauntlet. Not his, but the younger Thanos' gauntlet. You think this changes anything, he says? You still can't snap your friends back without the space stone. And Captain Marvel laughs. Where do you think I got my powers from? Snap. Honestly, the fact that you can just explode the space stone and get free powers from it is super bullshit. But I saw the fake out potential of destroying the space stone and I was like, oh shit, I know how to make Captain Marvel interesting. <laughs> also, does anyone want like a Captain Marvel rewrite, by the way? That could be fun. Of course, this snap isn't that easy. She puts considerable force and tension into it, and her powers have to gather into the glove, and like, it sparks and glitches before she finally snaps and sends out a wave of energy pushing the others back. Except for Thanos, who's making a mad dash for the gauntlet and is now just being held in place by the energy. It's clear that something about the snap worked. New birds fly up from the canopy uh, around them, and perhaps like animals and insects undust themselves around Captain Marvel. But Marvel herself looks rough. You get the feeling that the gauntlet was not supposed to be used that way. Quickly, Thanos closes the gap while she's stunned. He adds the stones back to his own gauntlet and crushes the small gauntlet as the others pick themselves up from the blast. Then he uses the Mind Stone to take control of Captain Marvel. Her power flows into the gauntlet. Thanos looks a bit shaken now, but he says, Using your body as a stone was a mistake. You've only weakened yourself. And even if that snap worked, there's no guarantee it was powerful enough to reach your planet. He raises the gauntlet and tries to snap, but Thor slams into him, breaking his control of Marvel so he can't re-snap the universe. This was the big thing that bothered me uh, about the snap in Endgame. There was no tension, they get all the stones back, everything is fired and then they snap in the comfort of a warm Stark building. And that's not to say there, uh, there'd be any like tension per se in my version, no, the audience know the snap has obviously worked. What I mean is there's no tension for the characters. Where's the drama? Where's the spectacle? If the characters don't know if it worked or not, it makes the eventual reveal so much more emotional uh, for the characters because they've gone from their darkest hour to like, holy shit, it actually worked. But first we need to push that tension and also get our classic 1v3 from Endgame. While the others have been knocked out or helping those knocked out, uh, Cap, Thor, and Iron Man pick themselves up as Thanos speaks. But perhaps I was wrong about something. Even now, you still had a sliver of hope you were clinging onto. Between time travel and this, you've taught me something. Earth is different. Your heroes, your technology, your minds, your powers, they give you options, potential, ways to think you can change your fate. You're unlike the other planets I balanced. You have enough power to hope, but not enough to change anything. So all it does is prevent you from accepting what you've lost and moving into the future I've created. But that was my mistake. Today, your planet grieves. Fight begin. 
This fight plays out how it does in the movies. Thor, Iron Man and Cap are trying to either kill Thanos or hold him out for long enough uh, for the help that they can only hope is coming. Captain Marvel, as fucked up as she is, tries to join but they stop her, as Thanos may use the Mind Stone to control her and then undo the snap. With a much more powerful Thor, they manage to grab some of the stones back, which Captain America holds on his person. Eventually though, they get beaten down, with Thor getting beaten first, so that Cap has an excuse to use Molnir and hold out a little bit extra. This was obviously one of the highlights for the movie, and I wanted to keep this intact. Cap stalls by himself for a while, but as in the movie, he's eventually knocked down. But in this version, Thanos grabs the stones from him, and then grabs Marvel. He uses the Mind Stone on her to charge the gauntlet, and gets ready to snap, but he notices the Soul Stone is missing. Nebula, the assassin, snuck in and took it, and she chucks it into the forest. I take it back, I didn't treat you harshly enough. I just can't stop failing you, can I father, she says triumphantly. Thor cheers at this. You know, going into this, uh, I wasn't expecting to write like a Thor Nebula ship, but I, I'm kinda into it. <laughs> Anyway, now that he's unable to re-snap the universe, Thanos instead opens a portal. The Sanctuary 2, Thanos' ship, appears through it and an army begins to gather. He sends a small force to look for the stone, but he will finish the Avengers himself. A bloodied Cap readies Molnir, but with his shield in pieces, Thor down and five stones in Thanos' possession, they're out of time. Until... On your left. Obviously, I've kept the scene, that's a big moment. I ain't taking credit, obviously, but hopefully what I've done gives the scene much stronger setup. Alright, this scene basically marks the end of the big scene changes, except for the very end, so I'm gonna give a general guide for this battle. So first, I, I really don't like the st stupid subplot about trekking the gauntlet through the enemy lines past Thanos to get to the stupid fucking time travel there. Can't Hulk just snap again with the other hand? Was that too hard? What, the, the nanotech couldn't change form to the other hand? It, it did it on the fly with Iron Man! I just, get rid of this part. The main conflict for this battle is this. They need to put enough pressure on Thanos until he's forced to bring the two younger Thanoses through to the present. After all, even if they stop Thanos, the other two are working towards their own snap, and when they achieve it, they're going to continue their chain throughout the multiverse. And here's where we get our explanation on why Doctor Strange said there was only one way in 14 million to defeat Thanos. Now that he's back on the battlefield, he explains to Stark that they always lose to Thanos because even when they beat him, another Thanos from another universe will always come to snap them anyway because they're not the universe that creates, fights, or even knows about Thanos Prime, the Thanos that starts the chain. The only way to not eventually get snapped by the chain is to be the universe that creates the chain, or creates Thanos Prime, and then beats him. To stop the chain, to even know about the chain in order to stop it, you must be the one universe that gives up the time stone, loses, creates Thanos Prime as a result, lets him start the chain, find out about the chain, and then beat him, stopping the chain before it can spread. Does that make sense to everyone? I, I boggled my mind trying to think of this and then continued to boggle my mind trying to wrap my head around what I had just thought of. <laughs> Much like the axe creation at Nibble Lear, I think Doctor Strange's 1 in 14 million gambit was sort of a throwaway scene just to hype things up, but I felt like it could have been like, had like had a more real and tangible reason behind it, and so this is what I ended up with, so yeah. So we have this glorious moment as the Avengers assemble and start decimating Thanos' forces, and this is what forces him to, once he gets a hold of Marvel again, open up a portal and bring one of the two younger Thanoses in. This is the main reason I've kept these two Thanoses young. I don't want the Thanos we all know to feel like part of a match set and take away from his impact, so I've decided to keep both the extra Thanoses young. The logic being that Thanos Prime opted to go for universes 300 years prior to avoid the Avengers, while collecting a lot of the stones when they were easier lo in, when they were in these easier locations and they had a lot of intel about them. It also means those Thanoses have a significant head start to carefully build their forces and secure places like Nivadalir. You can also say that 300 years ago was before Nivadalir was under Asgard protection, but that's, I'm getting a bit too lore heavy. <clears throat> it's also worth knowing that Thanos didn't even know about time traveling being a possibility when he did this, so he thought he had time to do it. When Thanos' forces become overwhelmed and he decides to bring in the younger ones, he also tells them not to bring any stones they've collected with them because he doesn't want them falling into enemy hands. After all, these Thanoses have 300 years less experience, but this means our Thanos stays as the sole dominating force on the battlefield. Before we get to our final moment, I want to have a bunch of little moments you could have. Uh, firstly, I'd love to have a fight on top of one of the Praetorians. Uh, that just sounds fun. I mean, come on. Secondly, to avoid uh, things feeling too samey in hindsight, I probably would have made the garden uh, more of an interesting alien plant with some weird like giant fauna and flora. 
that could interact with the fights more. You could also have the fights take place around these things as one party from the Avengers goes to follow the chase for the Soul Stone in the forest. There's also a bunch of dramatic locations like waterfalls and mountains to make use of. With the battle in part taking place inside these ships or on Praetorians brought through the portal, it'd be a great excuse to have people fall off or be dragged out to these locations. Thirdly, I'd love to have a moment dedicated to Rocket reuniting with the Guardians. As I said, he's had a whole movie where he's learned to not push away the people he loves, and now he's lost his whole family. So I'd love to have a moment where he temporarily regresses on this. He sees the Guardians and gets mad. He goes down the line talking about how he heard how each of them screwed up. Quill's a big hearted emotional idiot who threw away everything because he got angry. Groot's a teenager who thinks he's above everyone and could have easily done more if he at the start if he had got off his game. Drax is a thick headed screw up who keeps recklessly risking his life to avenge his old family. And Mantis, yeah, he doesn't know what she did, but she probably screwed up somewhere. But after he's done with his angry rant, Quill just says, we missed you too, bud and Rocket just breaks into uncontrollable tears, all while trying to deny it. I'd also love to have a scene uh, where Drax sees the younger Thanos and goes, you took everything from me. I don't even know who you are. I, I had to keep that line somehow. <laughs> but I also want Drax to get closer to him, only to realize he looks like a much younger version uh, than the one he knows and goes, no, you are not Thanos. You are much too young. And then he smiles and laughs and says, This is perfect. Thanos took my wife and daughter from me. Now he too will know what it is like to lose his son. <laughs> this was a thing in the Guardians of the Galaxy movie. He tried to do this with Gamora and I figured this would be the perfect time to do a callback to it. The last thing Drax knew was being on Titan and then rocking up to this battlefield to continue the fight. Time travel would not have been his first conclusion upon seeing a younger Thanos. It would be funny to see Thanos try to convince him that he's a time traveled Thanos and, and Drax thinks he's trying to trick him, but it would also give him a hilarious but satisfying one-on-one -on -one conclusion to his revenge story. It'd also be funny to see him join the fight on, uh, join in on fighting like the real Thanos and be like, I killed your son and Thanos is just incredibly <laughs> confused. One important thing I should add is that Captain Marvel gets free from the Mind Stone's influence at some point. This happens specifically because Thanos gets injured. Thor specifically should notice this. This is important setup. I think after this, Captain Marvel should get three and probably like beat one of the other Thanoses. If anything, just to show how strong she is, even in this weakened state. I haven't done much with her because she's functioning as a space stone. So before she goes back to that, her uh, like her role in the narrative, it'd be good to have her like get free and do something. The only thing I'd add here is like one last climax of spectacle. Before Thanos is forced to bring the second young Thanos in, he's in a face off with Thor and all he has at his disposal is a space stone and power stone, as he looks around and sees his forces beginning to falter. And he says, God only knows this garden is the only thing you have ever loved. That's what you said to me. But you are wrong. It's not that I don't love anything. It's that I was always prepared to lose everything. He closes his fist and deep purple cracks appear below him that stretch further and deeper, destroying the plants, the garden, everything. The entire planet begins to come apart, threatening to strand and suffocate everyone in deep space. Yeah, let's have a fight on like floating chunks of planet as they begin to crumble into space. We'll resolve it of course, maybe Doctor Strange can reclaim the time stone and reverse it. Maybe it give him more to do than just hold back, hold back water. <laughs> Seriously, what the fuck was that? Anyway, after this, the Power Stone is taken from him, uh, but he gets back the Space and Time Stone, leaving him only one option to bring in the second and last young Thanos and his men. But now they've successfully drawn out all the Thanoses, they quickly find that they can't keep up in this battle of endurance. This is now far too many enemies to fight. The Avengers forces start to get overwhelmed. Meanwhile, a battle rages with Thanos Prime to gain control of the stones and snap the enemy. The stones have been going back and forth, constantly trading with Thanos, neither are ever managing to get all five and get control of Captain Marvel at the same time. But finally, Thanos does, and just like in Infinity War, Thor rejoins the fight from the sky at the last minute, throwing the axe. Instinctively, Thanos raises his gauntlet, once again firing the beam that gets cut through. But knowing what's about to happen, he cuts the beam off and raises the gauntlet to his neck to block the axe but finds that Thor has done the exact same thing, implanting the axe in his body. They look at each other for a moment before Thanos says, you've learned nothing. And Thor says, are you sure about that? A slight nervousness in his voice. He reads him for a second and then says, I am, I am inevitable and snaps his finger, 
but nothing happens. He turns the gauntlet and sees that the stones are gone, and that Captain Marvel has limped all the way towards Tony Stark. She tosses the stones to him and puts his hand on his shoulder. Her power flows through him as the stones become the makeshift gauntlet. And I am Iron Man. After the snap happens, the Avengers out there fighting who were just before getting overwhelmed start to have the pressure lifted off them as the army turns to dust. Thanos looks to Thor, and Thor says, My friends were being overwhelmed out there, and all I needed to do to help them was break your control over her. I'm not going to risk aiming for the smallest target, just so that I can say I beat you. In fact, I lost our fight, I admit it. You won. I don't care about it anymore. But we win the war. And then he just walks off. He doesn't revel in it, he doesn't look back, he goes to help the other Avengers. Thanos doesn't say a word. He just pulls himself up, and looks at Tony, who looks really bad, like death walking. But even so, he looks back at Thanos and pulls himself up too. So in the movie, Thanos just dies silent, and I don't think this is out of character. He's a very somber person, and this seems like, you know, how he'd take defeat. But it's just like a little bit, I don't know, underwhelming. Additionally, Iron Man also kind of just goes out like a bitch, no final words or quips, or like a, I love you. Why do Marvel movies decide now to be realistic? So, after the snap, I want Thor to remove his axe, step back, and walk off, but I want Thanos to get up and limp towards Tony, and Tony, with his last bit of strength, does the same. As Thanos limps towards him, he says, This isn't over. Do you remember what I said? Whether I'm dead or not, the same problem will ravage the universe, and the same prophets will rise up with the same solution. And while that snap did reach your planet, there must have been thousands of others it did not. He takes the gauntlet off and he crumples it in his hands so that it can't be used again and tosses it aside. When they prosper and grow far beyond your planet, they'll realize I was right, and they will seek balance. The two meet each other halfway. Tony still hasn't said anything. You can kill me, Stark, he says, as he starts to turn to dust, but you can't kill an idea. Tony looks up at him and puts his palm on his chest. Speaking as a billionaire genius, Ideas are cheap, he says, before he primes the laser on his palm. It's about how you execute them. And he fires a blast through Thanos just as he's starting to turn to dust, so it looks like he's literally just been blasted into dust. How's that for a one-liner? Should I have kept the execute part, or is it just snappy or just ideas are cheap? I felt like it worked too well to not include. Execute has a double meaning, and it's a callback to the ideological war between them about humanity being able to find a solution to any problem through innovation rather than have a solution forced on them by Thanos. I don't know. <clears throat> anyway, I think it's important to give Thanos something so he feels as if he had more of an impact. You know, the snap was good, but since we reversed it, it kind of makes him feel meaningless. This is why I actually love the concept of the blip. Even in future Marvel movies, it feels like Thanos happened, you know. But this is like an extra layer you can add to it without having to kill any beloved characters. Since the locations of the planet aren't specified, you can say that all planets with named characters on them exist between the Garden and Earth, which is the proximity of Captain Marvel Snap. But it leaves you the option in future to introduce characters who are a direct result of Thanos' ideology. Maybe they wouldn't be the main villains unless that you know they were only just inspired by Thanos and had like a different like opinions. But they could be really interesting side characters thrown into future movies that will make everything feel connected. And that Thanos had some level of lasting impact. Technically speaking, they could like snap again to get the rest of the universe back, but that's like a whole other question. You'd have to go to multiple places. You'd probably have to sacrifice Marvel because this is fucking her up each time. You'd also have to sacrifice someone for each snap. Remember I mentioned earlier that even if Hulk uses uh, more than one stone, it'll kill him with the Iron Man gauntlet, since it doesn't stabilize the energy as well as the Infinity gauntlet does. There's also the fact that Tony Stark is dead, and they don't even know how to replicate his gauntlet. Speaking of with this, uh, Tony Stark collapses and his body too begins to disappear into dust. Not quite in the same way, it seems like this is more of an effect of the gauntlet rather than like he snapped himself or something. If you're looking for some final lines for Tony, I'd probably go with this. Uh, Rhodey, Pepper Potts, and Peter Parker are all around Tony in his final minutes. Peter desperately tells him not to go, the world needs Iron Man after all. And he says, Psh, the world will be fine. Iron Man's right here, and he points to Pepper, and here, and he points to Rhodey, and here, and he points to Peter. Uh, so that's an honor, Mr. Stark, but I don't think I'm... And he says, I'm talking about the suit I designed. Keep up, kid, Stark says, chuckling. We're funny creatures, aren't we? Humans, I mean. We're fleshy, bruise easy, that never changes. But with every life we build on each other, our knowledge, our creations... Man, I had some great creations, didn't I? 
But he smiles and says, But I'm just a guy in a suit. In your hands, they'll be amazing. Pepper says he can rest easy now, and he drifts away. Uh, and there we go. How do they do? Uh, I like data, so feel free to hit me with brutal criticism if you want. Uh, help, share me with your friends. Make it a gangbang. Just give me data. Share me on your Discord or something. And if you really like this rewrite, uh, check out some of my others, or check out my webcomic slash web novel Airlock Bound. It's a totally public domain franchise I created to prove to people that we don't need copyright, or at least that's the idea. Check it out and support me and the artists on Studio IC. Goodbye! <coughs> my throat hurts. I've been. How much? I start at 10. To I've been recording for four hours. Fuck my life.